Well, hello there. Um, it's been a while. Uh, like many of us, I have fallen down the Baldur's Gate 3 rabbit hole. Uh, loved this game. Managed to get 100% Steam achievements on this game. Done several playthroughs at this point. And I do want to make a couple videos over time showcasing what I think are weird builds. They're, they might be good. They might not be good. But the real emphasis is just that they're weird and unusual and unexpected. Uh, so I have a few things in mind. Like I want to talk about how you can do a dex-based hunter ranger that takes great weapon master. I want to talk about some RP builds based on Lord of the Rings characters. But today, I want to talk about Karlak. Uh, because Karlak, by default, is a barbarian, and you can leave her as a level 12 barbarian. And normally you would associate barbarians with tanking or doing damage. What you might not associate them with is CC and debuffs. But I think with this particular weird build, Karlak is a monster of a CC machine. Let let me get into let me get into it. I'm not gonna respec and show you leveling up from level one. But you're going to take Barbarian, your, your starting stats are going to be 16, 14, 16, 8, 12, 8. You can change that a little bit. I understand the argument for 16 decks instead of, and 14 con for uh, extra initiative, but the way I'm ultimately landing on this character, you're unarmored by the end of the game in Axe 3, so having more hit points and the same AC and initiative from other sources is better in my mind than just getting the, the extra two points of decks. Uh, there aren't a lot of choices to make leveling up. You're going to go Wild Heart. At level 3, you're going to pick Tiger Barbarian. At level 6, you're going to pick Aspect of the Wolverine. At level 10, you're going to pick Aspect of the Elk. And Feats, you're going to take an ASI for Strength at some point. Uh, you're going to leave Strength at 18 because you're also going to take the Mobile Feat and the Sentinel Feat. Uh, and at this point, I haven't really told you the motivation for that, so let's let's get into that. Why, why do we make those choices? Why do we want Tiger Barbarian? Why do we want Wolverine Barbarian? Well, the core of this idea is bleed and maim effects. The bleeding and maim effects are very good debuffs and a very good CC. Uh, at Tiger level 3, you get access to Tiger's Bloodlust when you're enraged which is an AoE attack that can hit up to three enemies and give them all the bleeding condition. What they are hiding here in the bleed condition is yes, you do a little bit of damage over time, uh, but also it gives those targets disadvantage on constitution saving throws. So if there's anyone else in your party that can uh, do anything based on a con saving throw, they're going to benefit from the fact that you've made things bleed. Beyond that, though, you're going to have Aspect of the Wolverine, which, when you attack a bleeding or poison target, but bleeding usually because of how easy it's going to be for you to get the bleed effect, you'll also maim it for one turn. Maim is amazing because it reduces the movement speed of an enemy to zero, and also gives them disadvantage on dex saving throws. So if you're throwing any fireballs out, any lightning bolts, any of these other spells that have dex saves, then uh, you're going to like those targets to be maimed already. What it doesn't say here in the tool tip is that the very attack that you use to proc the bleeding effect will also proc the maiming effect. Or in other words, if I use Tiger's Bloodlust, not only is that applying bleed to the three enemies that you can hit, it is also applying maim at the same time. <laughs> So that's why Tiger Barbarian, that's why Aspect of the Wolverine, and you can get that combo coming online at level 6, which is pretty early in the game. You'll probably be in Act 1 still. Now, beyond that, there are other things we can do to CC, uh, and that that's where our items come in. Oh, by the way, Aspect of the Elk Aura... This is simply to give you more movement speed. Movement speed is really good on this build because you're using melee damage to do your CC and debuffs, so being able to move around more is good. 
Uh, the reason we took the mobile feet and the sentinel feet is that the mobile feet allows you to hit something and then move away without rocking an opportunity attack. So you can bleed and by bleeding maim a creature, perhaps a melee enemy, and then step out of its range safely. It can't get to you, it can't hit you, it's their CC. It is now sad. The sentinel feature is honestly just more CC because you have ad uh, advantage on opportunity attacks and anything that runs past you is going to proc that opportunity attack. Probably get hit, but because of Sentinel, they're now stopped, so they can't run past you. So the main the main reason you take Sentinel is for that theme, where we're doing a sort of CC support barbarian build, and you're just trying to take advantage of stopping foes from running past you to get to other things that they might find, uh, like the rest of your party. Now there's a lot more we can get into based on items, and you might notice a couple unusual items I have here on Karlak right now. Primarily, you're going to notice this uh, this great club called the Punch Drunk Bastard. This, this is a very fun great club. It is not... Well, honestly, it's pretty terrible for damage, because it's taking a two-handed slot, and its base damage is only rolling at d8, and it only has a plus one enchantment. <clears throat> so, given that we only have 18 strength, 1d8 plus 5, average 9.5 damage just from the club, that is, uh, that's pretty bad, honestly. Tenacity is nice sometimes, um, but it's the other effects that we're going for that are going to make this good. In particular, while you are drunk, you have advantage on attack rolls, which is nice, it means we get advantage on attack rolls without using reckless attack so we won't uh, necessarily be taking as much damage in return. But more importantly, you create a blast with each attack, dealing 1d4 thunder damage in a 3 meter radius. And this part of the build, this, this idea I owe a lot to a whole video that Build the Barbarian made a few months ago on YouTube, highlighting this, uh, highlighting this item and how you can use combos around this item. But he also made a separate video on a different Bleed Mame build that I had not seen when I started playing around with Bleed Mame on Karlak. And he goes a very different direction uh, in his Bleed Mame than I do. <clears throat> he really focuses down on uh, being a two-weapon fighter, wearing medium armor as a barbarian, focusing on the Bleed Mame and running away, and doesn't add Sentinel, doesn't uh, add, in fact, this, uh, this great club, Punch Drunk Bastard. Which I think just makes the CC that you're already doing from Bleed Maim even better uh, because of the other items that we can add. So hold on to this. This comes... well, I'll talk about item locations at the end, but let's look at the other items that we have. To get drunk, all you need to do is drunk alcohol, which are camp supplies. That's going to be a bonus action. Just carry a stock on you on Karlak and you'll be fine. You'll be able to get drunk, uh, and then you'll start proccing the Templar's Rage effect. There is one... well, there are two items in the game that also synergize with, uh, with Drunk. There is a piece of clothing sold in the guild hall, but there is also this uh, Amulet of the Drunkard. This is nice because usually Drunk lasts for two turns. It makes Drunk last for five turns. So that, that's going to give us more bonus actions to use, uh, since we won't have to drink as much. That's going to help us uh, keep our drunk uh, rage longer. It says it heals you two to four hit points per turn while drunk. Uh, I, I might have misnoticed this, so we'll, we'll check this again when we do a little combat demo. But in my experience, I think it's only healing you when you drink uh, and not later when you're drunk, uh, but we'll pay attention in the combat uh, sample that we'll do in a little bit because maybe I've just had some other bugs going on. So this is already going to synergize well with the Punch Drunk Bastard. Uh, it's going to help us keep that Templar's Rage going longer. <clears throat> and of course, you can just drink your alcohol right before starting combat and not even spend a bonus action in combat doing it, which is going to allow you to rage to get into the lead part of your build faster, and that's going to be really solid. Uh, in Act 1, you can pick up these gloves of belligerent skies. 
And this is where the idea, the build idea really starts taking off. Because now, when you deal thunder damage, which you're going to be doing with the d4 of thunder damage from Punch Drunk Bastard, you will inflict reverberation on the target, which is a debuff. Uh, reverberation, for those not aware, is one of those turn-based stacking buffs like Radiant Orb or Arcane Acuity. It reduces the physical saving throws on a target, and when your target hits five or more turns of reverberation, it'll take 1d4 of thunder damage, which is just great because you always want to proc more damage, and then possibly fall prone. Uh, the DC on that, I think, is 10, if I recall correctly. It might be 12. It's a dex save, so as you get lighter into the game, fewer and fewer enemies are going to fail it. But because you're able to do AoE attacks, because you're going to be able to stack so much reverberation on things, eventually you're going to get enemies just uh, crit failing and falling prone because of that. And prone is great CC, especially when they're maimed, uh, because sometimes when they're prone and maimed, they're able to stand up, sometimes not. Um, haven't really noticed any consistency there, but it definitely helps uh, prevent enemies from recovering from their, their maim effect and makes it likely that they'll skip their turn. So having a great way to knock them prone from reverberation, that's that's pretty good. So that's that's the gloves. Now, that'll also proc off of radiant damage. And a really easy way to do that is the Callus Glow Ring, which you can pick up in Act 2. When you deal damage to a target that is illuminated, it will also take two points of radiant damage. But those two points, which they don't mention here on the tooltip, they just say two points of damage, it happens to be two of radiant damage. That radiant damage will proc your Gloves of Belligerent Skies, so now with one hit on one target, you've already gotten them to four stacks of, radiation, uh, of reverberation. If you're attacking two targets in a radius, though, for example with the Tiger's Bloodlust, you're going to proc this Tipler's Rage, Rage Explosion on both of them. Which means they're going to get 1d4 of thunder damage from, from your hit, proccing the explosion, and 1d4 of thunder damage from the explosion on the other nearby target. So that alone is going to give them 4 stacks of reverberation. The Callus Glow Ring's 2 radiant damage on each of them will give them another 2 stacks of reverberation. What does that do? more thunder damage, and the ability to potentially knock them prone. So that's that's the core combo. The rest of the items are more supportive to this. I really like the Bone Spike curb set that's available in Act 3. I think it, it justifies the low AC you end up with of AC 16, because there's so many other hidden effects that come in through it. Uh, from a CC perspective, the boots give you Brutal Leap, which I think is really great, because now as a bonus action, you can jump and possibly knock things prone, which is CC that we love to have, just adds to the total CC and support theme of this build. I think the garb's really great, because 15 temporary hit points whenever you rage, as well as reducing all incoming damage by 2. That's normally something you only see on heavy armor. That's like magical plate armor. That really helps make up for your lack of AC. When you start getting hit by like piercing damage by like the ball cultists in Act 3, honestly, they're barely hitting you. And, of course, you have retaliation damage of 3 piercing damage from this, so uh, those ball cultists start doing about as much damage to you as you're doing in retaliation to them because you're also going to wear the Flesh Melter Cloak. Technically, there's a Reverberation Cloak you could wear <clears throat> that also has um, Retaliation for targets that have Reverberation on you, but I really do prefer Flesh Melter in this build, because the 1d4 Acid Damage of Reprisal on top of the 3 Piercing Damage of Reprisal from Bone, Sc Bone Spike, and the fact that if they crit on you, this 1d4 Acid Damage return crits on them uh, is really nice. Uh, it really means that you go out there, you CC a bunch of stuff, you sit somewhere where enemies are likely to attack you, they start doing not that much more damage to you than you're dam doing to them, thanks to, you know, your uh, your resistances from Rage, your absorption through the Bone Spike Garb, that's all great. 
Then the Bone Spike Helmet is amazing for this build because one, when you rage, you might, uh, <clears throat> you, you do psychic damage in an explosion, but more importantly, you get a menacing attack. Menacing attack is usually a Battlemaster fighter skill. It usually takes a superiority dice. This is just a free menacing attack once per turn, which possibly frightens your target, which is great. Frightened is really good CC. They cannot move, and they have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls. Absolutely amazing. And even though the tooltip here says on miss does not spend superiority dice, that's just because it's a copy-paste from the skill on Battlemaster Fighter. You, you don't have superiority dice. You're a pure barbarian, but you just get this for free once per turn, which is really great. Now, the short rest abilities that you get with the Great Club... The cleave is amazing because even if you're not raging, you now have an AoE attack uh, that can proc multiple Templar's Rage effects. So, you know, I usually like my days in Baldur's Gate to last for more than five combats, which is the maximum rage charges that you have. So I don't like raging every combat. This cleave gives you once per short rest an ability to do AoE attacks without being enraged. That's going to help you get an extra few combats in per day. <clears throat> And then, of course, once per short rest, you have Backbreaker. Chance to knock enemies prone, just very thematic for the build. Throw away a comment, I usually equip Hellrider longbows on my Barbarians. You already get plus three initiative and inability to be surprised from Barbarian level seven. Plus two initiative from your dex modifier and plus three from this bow. You'll be up front at initiative most of the time. There are a couple boss fights where you won't be, but... You'll be early enough in the turn order to do your thing. Now this isn't the only way to build this. <clears throat> I'm going to do a quick um, combat demo uh, on these Flaming Fists here of this like pure CC build soon. But I wanted to talk about some alternatives and some sort of item leveling paths that you can consider. Now as you can see I've left Crusher's Ring in the other slot. That comes up pretty early in Act 1, you know where to get that. Uh, Haste Helm, you also get pretty early in Act 1, and honestly, I think that's the best helm for this from uh, the time you make it to the Blight Village all the way until you can buy your Bone Spike Helm. Because just getting extra move speed for most of your turns in combat is really good for this build. Um, if you didn't care about the Reverberation, you can still do Bleed Maim. And I think you can get more damage out of the build. And you would do that by equipping Bone Spike Gloves, which means your attacks will ignore resistance to physical damage spike types. That's pretty good. But I think the way you would do it, since you don't have Great Weapon Master Fighter... <coughs> sorry, Great Weapon Master as a feat, is you would dual wield. Um, obviously, before a certain boss fight in Act 3, you're not going to have this short sword. That's uh, that's fine, but this is just you know like the pretty much the best short sword in the game. So once you have it, you're going to use it. You're going to put it in your main main hands because you're a barbarian. You can get reckless attack, and so you can be attacking with advantage most of the time. So you're going to get that red vein savagery most of the time. The extra necrotic damage dice is great, and the uh, extra die of damage to targets below fifty percent is great for damage. Uh, but the other item is the slicing short sword. And I always put this in the offhand because, well, you could put it in the main hands, but it usually does less damage than other options you have. So what I like to do is reckless attack with your main hands. Then you will be attacking with advantage, which will inflict bleeding and hence maiming with your bonus attack, and then you can run somewhere else and hit something else hard with your main hand. Um, certain parts of the game, this might be your best short sword, so you might make it main hand, and then you'll get two uh, single target bleeds per turn. Uh, when you're enraged, though, that doesn't matter because you have Tiger's Bloodlust, you want to spend your actions on that. So that this would only be a, a better setup when you are not enraged. Uh... Before you get your Bone Spike Garb, uh, you can buy these Gloves of the Balanced Hands <coughs> in Act 2. That's just a nice way to get a little extra damage, so that's just an option to consider. 
Before you get your Bone Spike Garb, you can buy the Enraging Heart Garb in Moonlight Towers. That extra constitution is nice, also gives you extra AC because you're a Barbarian, so that's worth considering. Usually it's better just to go medium armor though, early game. And when you're leaning into the CC of it, Luminous Armor, coupled with Callous Glow Ring, means you're going to start stacking Radiating Orb and Little Explosions. Radiating Orb, well, uh, inflict radiating, or radiating Orb. Affected Entity has minus one to attack rolls for each turn remaining, so that just means enemies are just going to start missing. Amazing debuff. Now, usually I won't do this on the Barb because it's going to be on a Cleric, but you could consider if you're not running like a Spirit Guardian's Cleric, starting in Act 1 when you get to the Selunite out Outpost and pick this piece up, and then Act 2 once you get to the Potter's House and could get the Callous Glow Ring. That combo, so really only starting in Act 2 because you need the ring for the combo, uh, is fine on Barbarian to get extra debuffs. Again, I've not done that. I That's not the route I go. I'm usually going with the... Sorry, Callous Glow Ring is not uh, from the Potter's House. That's from... Callous Glow Ring is from the chests by Balthazar in the first room where you need Balthazar and two. Um, also matching, if you didn't want to go Gloves of Belligerent Skies or you missed it for some reason and you really wanted to lean into Radiating or Luminous Gloves work too when you're syn synergizing with Callous Glow Ring, but I think that's, a, that's not the right choice if you're going to go Punch Drug Bastard because you want the Thunder Damage and the Reverberation. Cold Brim Hat is actually a decent option until you get your Bone Spike Helmet from when you get it in Act 2 in Moonrise Towers. Because at that point in the game, you can have your Punch Drug Bastard, you can have your Reverb Gloves, which means you're inflicting conditions a lot. And every time you inflict a condition, you can also inflict Encrusted with Frost. Uh, that's not bad. That's just yet another little debuff that you can add on. Encrusted with Frost is not the most amazing thing. Uh, stacks up to seven turns, and then they have to succeed a con saving throw or take 1d4 cold damage and become frozen. Um, but, you know, it's another debuff to add. Uh, it's another little bit of cold damage. Frozen's really good if they do fail the throw, because they're completely encrusted in ice and incapacitated, and they're uh, going to shatter to bludgeoning, thunder, or force damage, and you do a lot of those. <clears throat> but you're usually not going to do that, because Haste Helm's pretty good for momentum still, and then you're going to get Bone Spike Helmet, which I think is just better for the build anyway. Anyway... Let's do a little bit of combat demo with this setup, which I think was the default setup I explained. Before that, Bone Spike Helm, you can buy that from Penitent Barethi in the Undercity Ruins in Act 3. Flesh Melter Cloak is available in a chest in a certain part of a certain morgue in Act 2. Bone Spike Garb you can buy from the Dragonborn Fender in the Rivington General Store early in Act 3. Ex -via or whatever she's called. Gloves of Belligerent Skies come from a chest in a certain part of the Fresh in Act 1, so you can get that on very early, even before you're ready with your Great Club. Uh, Bone Spike Boots come from a certain cave down by a certain beach in Rivington early in Act 3. Um, Bone Spike Gloves, if you want to go the, the two-handed route, that comes uh, again in Act 3 from a certain gauntlet associated with a certain god of murder. You'll need to find someone called Strangler Luke, kill him, and loot him. If you wait too long to loot him after you kill him, he can disappear, so make sure you pick those up uh, when you get to Strangler Luke and kill him. <clears throat> uh, yeah, if you if you don't recognize this one, I'm not going to spoil it, because I don't think this is build essential. You can just use any other really good short sword. Slicing Short Sword, which I think is good if you want to go the dual wield version of this. You can buy from Damon at the last light in. Um, let's see, Callus Glow Ring I mentioned comes from near Balthazar. Crusher's Ring comes from Crusher in the Goblin Camp, Act 1. Amulet of the Drunkard comes from Hoops 
in Shress's Caress uh, early in Act 3. You can buy that from her Hellrider Longbow. I've forgotten where exactly that comes from. Might be Damon in Act 3, but double check me on that. Unstrung Bastard is available in a chest uh, behind Thistlebald Thorn, uh, the brewer in the brewery in Act 2. So, oh yeah, these are sold, these Gloves of the Balanced Hands, if you go that route, are sold by Quartermaster Tally at the left side in, if you want to go that route. Uh, this is sold by Lan Tarv in Moonrise Towers, if you want to go that route. And this hat is available in a chest upstairs in Moonrise Towers, if you want to go that route. Um, you can also technically use Boots of Stormy Clamor as well with this build. I just think uh, it stacks Reverberation really fast, but it's worse than having the option to jump with Bone Spike for Prone. Uh, that is available purchased from Omeluum in the Mycodet Colony in Technically Act 1. Alright, so let's go ahead and uh, stir up some trouble. Let's demonstrate how this works. Take our alcohol and we drink it. And we immediately just attack the nearest thing. Great! We win initiative. Um, I'm going to get some of these out of here because I really just want to emphasize the Karlak build. And we're not going to actually go through with all this fight, I just want to demonstrate how things work. Normally, Shadowheart, as the wizard that I have her built up as, synergizes really well with everything going on here because of... Uh, usually I actually give her some of the reverberation gear instead, but uh, let's go back here. So, because we got drunk before combat, we can go ahead and rage. Nice, he saved, he didn't take damage, he took half damage. Um, but let's go ahead and use a Tiger's Bloodlust. Alright, so, combat lag, what happens there? You saw a bunch of things explode. I used Tiger's Bloodlust. I inflicted bleeding on both of them. The one I crit got 14 bludgeoning damage, the one I didn't crit get 9. Um, they Failed these saving throws against Fiendish Fire. This, this is actually coming from Hellrider Longbow, which I wasn't using. So apparently it's checking Fiendish Fire even though I'm using the other weapon. So ignore that, that's not actually relevant to what we're doing at the build. Fist Colts. Fist Colts, sorry, there we go. Uh, took two thunder damage from an explosion on him, as did Fitzcross. Um, Gauntlet Thunder. Is that somewhere? What's this? Oh. Is that invisible? Or is he just on a different plane? Anyway, he was near the explosion on Colts, so he took thunder damage too. Now Fitz Colts also took thunder damage from the explosion on Cross. Um, sluggardly is the condition from mobile when you get hit by the attack. Uh, notice we only got to do one Tiger's Bloodlust uh, because technically the random hit I threw on Cross to start this fight counted as one of my two attacks this turn. Sluggardly uh, means that I can run away from you without procking an opportunity attack. You'll notice they have two turns of bleeding, one turns of maim, and the main guy, Colts who has multiple turns of reverberation on him. Unfortunately, reverberation... Uh... Wait, no, his his reverberation stack's already exploded, because I got that up to six. He... let's see if I can find it. In combat log... Oh, 
I'm not finding it in the combat log, but he would have had six reverberation, which has now exploded and fallen off. That might account for some of the thunder damage he taken. Obviously, he saved his throw to fall prone. Now, these guys are blood and maim, so I can just run away from them. And they can't get any of us anymore. Oh, I'm taking this uh That was bad of me. I shouldn't have taken the Steel Watcher opportunity attack, because now I'm maimed. Ha 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 ha. That the last two turns, that's annoying, but uh, that allows me actually to reposition some things, which uh, might be to our advantage, so that I can get another round demonstrating the effects. Steel Watcher is going to do its thing. It's going to miss the hard to hit things. It's going to take an opportunity to attack from my Water Myrmidon because it's dumb. Uh, my Paladin here. It's actually going to demonstrate that we can add even more great effects by using Falar Olive Shriek. Great times. Uh, I'm just going to. Ah, uh, it didn't fail the Dave, so. The Dave's throw, but yeah, that's fine. These other fists are going to come out. Let's see if. Any of them. Hit, hit on the water myrmidon. I'm not going to use the temple charm. Look, man. Steel Watcher is actually messing with me because uh, Steel Watchers cannot. Um, fall prone, or they don't, Steel Watchers don't bleed, so they, they don't really fall into the CC that we do. Oh, nice. Vulnerable to cold damage. Anyway. So notice the ones that we bled and maimed are stuck, so they're forced to just uh, throw their javelins and hope for the best. Notice the reprisal damage going on this uh, fist was more total than the damage that we took. We took 6 damage, we returned uh, 12 damage. Contra elemental. You know, you know, you know, that just annoys me. So we're gonna take that. Oh good, we won the roll to uh, counterspell that. Cure wounds on themselves. You know, I, I care. Do whatever you want. That removes the bleeding condition, but uh, kind of too late in my opinion. You know, Murphy is dumb. Okay, so Garlac Fuck yes. is not having the best time here. Got to keep fighting. Who has tactical powers? Eh, nobody has the right tactical powers, but she can still be quite annoying. To this fist right here, frightened, reverberated, sluggardly, and you know what? For good measure, be bled and maimed, and you've taken, you know, all we're gonna do. So uh, this is thoroughly debuffed. Were we to say challenge him, them with a deck save, for example, they would not be in a great place. Oh, we're getting counterspelled. Darn. Oh well. But uh, would very likely have just fallen prone from that ice storm because of the minus four to the deck saving throws. Um, alternatively, I don't think my rogue Asterion here has literally anything that challenges a saving throw, but for the sake of a demonstration, this enemy was already basically dead, and now is completely dead, thanks to Asterion. Good job, boy. 
Is there a spot here? No, I can't go somewhere to hide. Uh, oh, can I make it over there? Not quite. Anyway, I'll just end his turn. Karlak, unfortunately, still being maimed kind of sucks for her. Unlucky. Hey, opportunity attack with advantage. Hey, reverberation does work on the Steel Watcher. And again, remember, Karlak has Sentinel. So after that Steel Watcher jumped, was unable to keep moving because of Sentinel. Um, and you notice reverberation, chilled. Uh, things are going in good directions for potentially killing that, uh, that Steel Watcher. I'm mostly trying to do this in a way that's going to be supportive. Technically, since I have an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, I can give even more radiant damage to, to Garlac, uh, which technically should spark more potential radiating orb if I had gone that route, but reverberation. Um, I'm not going to do that, I don't think. I think I'm just going to take swings at the Steel Watcher, because I'm not trying to emphasize what the rest of the party does, just trying to emphasize what Garlac does. Yeah, that's fine. Silence on the water Myrmidon does not matter. This does not matter. Especially when I can just break that, that uh, Madap's con concentration in any way. I oh, know. Shadowheart had Cloak of Displacement, which has now been broken for the rest of the rounds. Anyway, um. See if you can win that concentration. Nope, absolutely not. Nice. These guys are free now. Um, yeah, two damage to me. Two reprisal damages and two instances of Fowler Olive Shriek meant our reprisal damage did more damage than the damage taken. Not as good a balance there off this guy. Um, but that's just dice roll luck sometimes. Cast slow. <sighs> this guy's apparently dumb. Why was he over there in the first place? Mask cure wounds. It's a level 5. Don't know what that was about, but uh... Now this is actually really good for Karlak now to demonstrate, because she is <laughs> surrounded. So we can hit these two, these three first. Oh, even hit a um, random NPC. That's wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get uh, procs of reckless attack in that situation. Oh, that's fine. That makes sense because of a. Uh... No, you still got sluggardly just because I attacked you, even though you missed. So I can get away from this guy without an opportunity attack. I'm going to do the same over here to these two. All of these guys are now sluggardly against me, so I can just get away. Without provoking an opportunity attack, and I can even use this jump on this guy over here, and we knocked this guy prone. So let's 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 go over what I just did. This gauntlet is bleeding, sluggardly, bleeding, and maimed, and had some reverberation stacks pop. Did not fall prone, but took a bunch of damage. Bleeding and maimed has some reverberation stacks left. Bleeding and maimed. Missed on our one attack against him, but didn't provoke opportunity attacks because that's how mobile works. Uh, immune to bleeding, but uh, still took some damage, including thunder damage. And this guy knocked prone by our jump. So we have effectively CC'd three targets. We've, sorry, four targets. We've done damage to one, two, three, four targets. And we're going to keep getting some dots on several of those. And some of them should be out of javelins, so their turns are effectively going to get skipped. 
plus you know the effects of reverb etc um then we're just gonna go say over here now if people come up to me actually no we're gonna go in the in the singing sword room if people come up to me reprisal damage is going to be pretty good but a lot of people can't even get to me so it's pretty solid with a rogue you would obviously want to do roguey things such as this How much damage was that? Uh, 39 piercing, 2 acid from a certain ring, and then 3 force damage from certain pairs of gloves. Yeah, that's pretty... That'll that'll do. That'll do, boy. That will do. Can I get my happy buff now? Yes. I'm gonna get my happy buff. This way. <clears throat> will I get counterspelled? Probably. So, we will bait it out with uh, something good. Yeah, bait it out with a cantrip. Sometimes, sometimes that's your job as a wizard. Waste spell slots. That reprisal damage was more than the damage taken. That's actually kind of hilarious. Um, not sure why that doesn't spark an opportunity attack, but it's what it is. Uh, now we want to move you probably here. Yeah, that puts singing sword on a lot of things we wanted on, and then I'm just gonna take my attacks with advantage on the prone target. I could be playing this way more optimally, but I'm just trying to demonstrate. Carlax build does. Do I even care? Master con save throws. Oh well. He's stuck. All he can do is throw a javelin, which he doesn't do great at, apparently. I forgot she even existed. See, all she got to do for her turn was stand up. <laughs> what is he? Oh, he's throwing javelins, but they're hitting the flag. <laughs> So now we can actually start by jumping into the middle of this um, and seeing how many people we knock from. Wait, my jump hit the flag. Okay, so there's some weird collision things in this game, no comments. That's nice. Crusader's Mantle is gone, not that that really mattered. Blood and Mames, Mames. Don't particularly want to hit the, pit at the civilian. Pretty solid. Now I could run away, say to here, and would be a sentinel foe if uh, this mana starts trying to get away from her silence cone. Uh, you are going to sneak attack this uh, five disadvantage because threatened. Right. And I don't particularly want to eat the opportunity attack of the Steel Watcher, so I'll have Shadowheart do that. That's why she has the Displacement Cloak. And uh, you'll get Counterspelled. Yep. Wasted another spell slot. Sometimes that's your job. Alright, let's get you where you're not threatened. Over here. And your job is to end her life and or break her concentration. Great! How much was that? 
This is just straight Assassin Rogue on Asterion, so... It was a crit with a sneak attack, so 75 piercing damage thanks to Sharpshooter. Nice. Two D eight piercing rolled a nine, plus two from the enchantment, plus five from Dex modifier, plus forty nine from the twelve D six the crit of sneak attack, plus ten from a sharpshooter, plus two acid damage from a certain ring, and five on a two D six from a certain um, set of gloves. Okay, that will uh, that'll do. That'll that'll enter. Um, that will do. Steel Watcher is going to do its thing and be generally annoying. Notice that appraisal damage was close to the amount of damage received. Always fun. Um, totally fine with that happening. And actually move to a more centralized location for the Shrieking. Solid. Shrieking, by the way, isn't just the bonus damage. It is a uh, Bane effect, which is nice. That's so nice. Water Myrmidons are so cool. Anyway. Oh, that's a uh, reverberation doing its thing. It's annoying we were out of counterspell opportunities, but um, I'm hoping that doesn't massively. Parallax is now slowed. Which is very annoying. But we can still use Carlax pretty well. Because... Are you slow? Why can't you... Oh, I'm just having a very hard time aiming. Path is interrupted by the Steel Watcher. Got it. What if I go up here? What if I go up here? Can I get advantage? Okay, I want to enter slow, so I'm just going to shoot one of these at her and hope for the best. That is that is fine. Way less damage than before, but ending concentration and getting Karlak gun slow worth it. So that's the kind of thing we can do in a team situation. So we're going to make these two sluggardly. Oh, you'll notice we're not drunk anymore, which um, is why we had to do reckless attacks. So let me drink more alcohol. Takes a bonus action, but uh, first of all, we got a heal there. Have we been getting a heal at the beginning of Karlak turns? I don't think so. Let's roll up to the earlier combat round four. Yeah, I don't think we're getting healed by alcohol earlier in combat, at the beginning of our turns. I think that is only happening when we drink the alcohol. So that's that's a error on the tooltip of that drunken necklace. Yeah, because we weren't getting healed here either. We don't have our jump, unfortunate, but we can run into the middle of these guys. And we can hit all of them. We missed him, but we're still sluggardly, and we still debuffed him with reverberation. And then we're going to run over to this, uh, this annoying person. And the next turn, she's going down. Oh yeah, we're going right behind this this girl. We're going to be a thorn in her side. 
Uh, will we get counter spells? No. Oh. Hey. <laughs> uh, unfortunate that he is now gonna blow up with two of our people in the radius of it, but uh, that is what it is. They lift. Could have been worse. Um, this is an easy target to finish off now. What path lies before me? We focus on getting these people in the circle of Shriek. That chick made some decisions. Yeah, that, that, that person's just bugged. That's why he's not visible, that's why the screen's going black. So, that guy's going to die. Haha! -ha! They actually fell prone from reverberation thanks to that proccing with the bleed effect. That's cool to see. Firebolt. Do not react. Karlak is not scared of, them, of fire damage. Sager's mantle. Let's just uh, end your life with Cyanic. Okay, so you are now a... Ooh, this is gonna be fun. Starion's turn is simple. It's just the simple things, you know? Just the simple things in life that count. Uh, Garlac is just going to end this person's life. Oh yeah, allies can get hit by the explosion, so that's usually why you want to try to proc the explosions farther away from allies, but, you know, I wasn't caring too much here, because we're almost done! We'll put a Frighten in case the Fist survives. The Fist did not survive. Um, where is this? Oh, that's the one still alive. Let's try to knock her prone. We did not, but that does maim her because she was bleeding. Uh, it does not count as giving her um, sluggardly, so you can still potentially eat an opportunity attack, which we would have taken for the reprisal, but it didn't happen. So now this uh, barbarian is stuck in place. So. We're just having fun from afar safely. We'll even just plink at her because she can't run to us. As I said, we're just gonna plink at her. She can't run to us. And then we'll let Karlak finish her off, hopefully. This should be it. Boom! That's it. I actually wasn't originally planning to finish the combat, but we did. And so, you know, we didn't play that great, but we definitely demonstrated the power that the build has. Come on, let's go. And you'll notice uh, most of the damage we took was on the Myrmidon and our Paladin from letting the Steel Watcher blow up on ourselves. Uh, Could have planned that better for sure. But yeah, this is, you know, it's not the highest damage build. The amount of control and damage reduction and reprisal damage all add up to be pretty, pretty strong. So I highly recommend playing this in any fight that's kind of mob-oriented and fun. Um, now, that makes you think, oh, it doesn't work in boss fights, but it does. If I can pull up paint just to show you something. This is this is a certain vampire boss fight. Uh, you enter where the green arrow is. The vampire boss is going to be in the middle of this platform. 
And then there are certain mobs that can make your fight miserable back behind him. Uh, there are going to be a couple Fallinger Hunters over here. There's going to be a couple Ghasts over here that can make you nauseous. And then there's going to be a Skeleton Mage here. Karlak, especially if hasted with this build, can begin the fight, go all the way over here, bleed and maim them, then go all the way over here, bleed and maim them, and then potentially get out of their melee range. And that's going to keep the scary things there were the um, Gas and Gur Hunters, who are melee. They're now out of the fight. The Skeleton is also scary because it's a mage, but you can, you can find other ways to deal with Chatter Teeth. Just that combo alone, though, and you can keep going back and forth, and on Honor Mode, staying out of Kazador's um, Bat Swarm pretty easily, and just keep these out of the fight until you get the boss down. That's the kind of tactic that's really strong with this build. Hopping back into game quickly. Just to be clear, we are on custom mode. But this was an honor rule set custom mode that we've been playing. Um, I've done some honor modes before, so this demonstrates everything that's going on. Um, these are all the default honor mode things. All the de default honor mode action economy all the tactician stuff, etc. that is working with this build. Thanks for watching.